Hey there, this is Jen Termel and this is General Chemistry Chem 120 at Southern Maine Community College using the OpenStax OER, Open Educational Resources for our textbook. Um, so what you're going to be doing is you're going to be watching this video and you're going to be hopefully taking notes. Pretend like you're in class. Don't watch it from the treadmill or the exercise bike, at least not the only time. Uh, so this is not really something that you want to be multitasking. So here I have some printed slides six to a page. I think that's a really, really great way to take notes is to print them six to a page like this and then take notes on them. Another option is that you just start with some blank paper and that you take notes on the, that blank paper. But however you're doing it, pause the video when you need to and take notes uh, as though you were sitting in class and that is really definitely the best way to learn this. All right, so let's go ahead and begin. One of the things that you'll find when we're working on here is that I'm going to be lecturing on video over the easy or simple topics that we're going to be learning in, the, in this class. And then in class, uh, if you're taking this class in person with me or sort of on your own, you'll be finishing it that way. And that way you're learning the easy stuff at home and then I can help guide you through the more complicated stuff uh, in person or uh, you know, via Zoom or online or something like that. So again, so you're gonna be uh, watching this video, reading the text, and then you're gonna be taking the reading comprehension quizzes. And then if it's an in-person class, we'll be working through uh, the end of the chapter problems and the recitation together. Uh, if it is not an in-person class, if you're taking this online because of COVID rules, then you'll be working on those things on your own. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look here. Here we just have the parts of this chapter that we'll be learning. Okay, so I'm still trying to figure things out a little bit on here. Okay, so what we're looking at when we do this is, um, is just basically let's go over a few things very quickly. Okay, so let's learn some terminology that goes along with the scientific method. Okay, one of those is a hypothesis. And you'll hear a hypothesis called a tentative explanation for observations. I also like to think of it as um, an educated guess. Okay. Another really great way to think of this hypothesis is as a question. Okay. Maybe grass is green because there's a chemical in it that makes it green. That might be a good idea of hypothesis. Okay. Now we have some other terms that we're going to look at. One is scientific laws. Okay. So when we talk about scientific laws, what we're looking at is we're looking at an explanation of what is happening. That might be the law of conservation of mass, which says that mass can't be created or destroyed. It's just an observation of what's happening. Law of conservation of energy, that um, energy cannot be created or destroyed, like from the laws of thermodynamics. That's what we mean by a law. A lot of people think that First we have a hypothesis and then we have a theory and then we have a law and it doesn't quite work like that. A law isn't more important than a theory. It answers something very different. A law describes what is happening. On the other side of that, we have a theory. A theory is well substantiated comprehension, comprehensible, testable explanation of a particular aspect of nature. So we've done lots and lots of experiments before we come up with our theory and theories answer the question, why is something happening? Okay, so why versus what? And that's a really, really important thing in that. Okay. So now we have some domains of chemistry, okay? And in here, we'll see that we have macroscopic domain, okay? And that is something that we can see in touch. So examples of the macro things in the macroscopic domain might be me, it might be my calculator, it might be my eraser, it might be my keyboard. <laughs> Those are all macroscopic things, things that we can interact with. Okay, next we have microscopic. The microscopic domain of chemistry is basically things we can't 
C. So in this area, think of things like atoms and molecules, okay? Okay, now atoms and molecules, those are much smaller than what we actually think of as microscopic. When we think of microscopic, we're thinking about things that we can see under a microscope often. Um, and atoms and molecules, you can't see under a regular microscope. So they're even smaller, but it works for the microscopic versus macroscopic domain. The symbolic domain contains a specialized language. Okay, so an example of the symbolic might be okay so macroscopic let's let me give you some examples of how these would work together a macroscopic thing might be the ocean the microscopic aspect of this might be water molecules and salt the symbolic domain might say well the ocean has h2o liquid and NaCl aqueous, okay? So liquid water and dissolved salt. So that's kind of how those three things work together. Okay, now let's take a look at the scientific method. So what's going on with the scientific method is that here we start with observations and curiosity ask a question. I always say science starts with a question, okay? If you're not asking the questions, you're not a scientist. And that's always a really big thing in politics as well. When they talk about scientific studies, you hear listening to the science a lot. So take a look. Are they actually listening to the science? Are they actually asking the right questions? Uh, because if you assume you know the answer to the question, you're not being a scientist. You're only being a scientist if you ask the question and then after making a little bit of a hypothesis or a prediction about why or what you think you might be seeing, then comes something really important. Then we need to perform experiments and make observations over and over and over again. And so from there, we take our results and we form our hypothesis, and then we come back to our experiment. And this is a very cyclical thing, okay? So always remember, that's really important. Remember we said a hypothesis can be a question. You have to ask a question and you have to honestly and legitimately want the answer. Not an answer you think you're going to get, but the answer. Okay. So we test it, we perform experiments, we fine tune our hypothesis, we go back and forth. Okay. If we don't support our hypothesis, and that contributes to our body of knowledge. If the results are consistent with the prediction, that contributes to the body of knowledge too. And we need to report both things. Now, if after that, we need to come back here and we make more hypothesis, more experimentation, this is a huge repeated cycle. Now we have a couple of different things. Okay, after that, after we have done this like 100 times or whatever, we see that we get constant observations. Sort of like think the law of gravity. So no matter how many times you climb to the top of a tree and drop an apple, it will fall to the ground. You could do it a hundred times or a thousand times or 10,000 times. No matter how many times you do it, that apple is going to fall to the ground. That's why gravity is a law. It summarizes what happens every single time. Okay, another option for this is that much additional testing supports our hypothesis explaining why. In that case, then the hypothesis becomes a theory. And again, why versus what? And it's what we're seeing there. Now, a really, really big thing, this diagram doesn't show it, but after it becomes a theory, guess what? We're not done. Once it becomes a law, we're pretty much done. We can say we're done here because all we're doing is saying what happens. You know, we don't have to continue to test the law of gravity on Earth because we know that. That's not going to change. It's just looking at what's going on. There's not going to be any new data on that. However, with a theory, there should constantly be new data. If they're not still doing experimentation, then the theory is outdated. They need to continue to do more of it. And so we come back here and we keep going. Okay, so this is just another example in this slide real quick of 
Here we have A is our macroscopic with the water and the icebergs. And B here, we can see what's going on, our, wa our liquid water, our solid water, and our gaseous water. And C, it doesn't actually show a C here, um, ex except in here where it says the formula H2O symbolizes water, okay? And so there it is. Oh, okay, that's what they mean here. So here we have C, and remember, C is our symbolic domain, okay? So I'll write that here. This is our symbolic domain. All right, and then here we have B, and B is our microscopic domain. And then up here, we have A, this thing that we can see, and that's our macroscopic domain. Okay. All right, now let's take a look at some phases and classifications of matter. Okay, so matter is anything that occupies space and has mass. So that can be solids, liquids, gases, as vapors, and all those different kinds of things. Now, a really important thing here is a solid, okay, there we go. A solid is rigid and possesses a definite shape. So see, here we have our lump of something. See, here we have our eraser. And my eraser is not going to change shape all on its own. It's just going to be here, eraser. Uh, I don't have a thing of water with me. Sometimes I have those kinds of props. But let's go ahead and take now at a liquid. A liquid flows and takes the shape of its container. OK, so here we have this. Now, let me go back to the solid for just a minute. It has, it's rigid and possesses a definite shape. And so what this means is that the shape and volume are constant. And constant basically means not changing. Okay, now let's take a look. Here we have our liquid. Well, a liquid has its own volume, okay? So it has, its volume doesn't change. Even if you pour it out, the amount of space it takes up is the same. Okay, so the volume is constant. But the liquid takes the shape of whatever we pour it into. So if you pour it on the floor, it spreads out. If you pour it into a thin glass, then it fills the glass. So you could say that it takes the shape of its container. In fact, instead of saying that, because that's up there, takes the shape of its container, let's go ahead and change that to saying variable shape. And now in this uh, flask here, we have gaseous water. Now, whenever we have gases, gases take both the shape and volume of their container. Okay, so that means that for a gas, the shape and volume are variable. And when we get to the chapter that deals with gases, we will see how not only does that shape change, but the volume can change very, very easily as with the pressure, pressure changing. So for liquids and solids, the pressure doesn't affect uh, volume almost at all. A very, very minute amount sometimes for liquids, but not very much, okay? Okay, so now let's take a look at matter. Okay. Mass is a measure of the amount of matter in an object. Weight refers to the force that gravity exerts on the object. Now in physics, you're gonna end up using these two terms in different ways. In this class, in chemistry, we tend to use them pretty much the same because we're not really gonna be looking at forces at all. So because we're not really looking at forces, sometimes we'll use the word mass and weight interchangeably. They don't exactly mean the same thing, but it's sort of just a, a figure of speech, a colloquialism that people use. Okay, now that brings us down though to our first law and that is the law of conservation of matter that says there is no change in the total quantity of matter or mass present when matter or mass converts from one type to another. Okay, so what does that mean for this class? Okay, well, you'll see here that that says it's true for both chemical and physical changes. So first of all, let's take a look at a physical change. So one example of a physical change is a change of state. So from solid to liquid. So let's say that we're melting water. Okay. So we go from saying that we have 10 grams of ice 
to 10 grams of, we'll just call it water, liquid water. Okay, so it's gonna be 10 grams of ice. So we have 10 grams of ice and we melt it, it's gonna become 10 grams of water. Now, maybe some of it will melt into a liquid and some of it will become a gas. You're still going to have 10 grams of water, 10 grams to 10 grams, that never changes. And that's an example of a physical change. Now in a chemical change, a chemical change occurs when you have an actual chemical reaction. Okay, so one example might be the synthesis of water. Now, the balanced equation for that is that you have two water, oh, whoops, uh, sure, I could go that way. We'll say the breakdown of water because then I can just leave it as this. Okay, when we're breaking down water, let's say that we have two uh, moles or quantities of gaseous water, okay? And that would become two moles of hydrogen gas and one of oxygen gas, okay? So notice here that we have two complete water units. So we have four hydrogens here and one complete oxygen unit. Don't worry about these diatomics and things like that. You're going to see that. Now with the law of conservation of mass, there's a really important thing that you can use from this. And you're going to be asked to do this, uh, especially in chapter two, when you're working with this plus the law of definite proportions. So when you look at this, okay, well, if you have two units of water, let's say that what we have is 36 grams. Okay, that means that you would have four grams of hydrogen and you would have 32 grams of oxygen. Again, don't worry too much about where I got those. You will totally understand within the next few weeks. But you'll notice that if we start with 36 grams of water and we take it apart into hydrogen and oxygen, we end up with four grams of hydrogen and 32 grams of oxygen. So we have 36 grams at the beginning and 36 grams at the end. And that's what's really important about the law of conservation of matter or the law of conservation of mass. Okay, so let's take a look real quick at this. Um, I will be handing out a periodic table that's not quite so colorful, but you can use this one too if you want to. Um, the one that I hand out in class or that you are supposed to print if you're at home is this, okay? It's from Web Elements. It's a great periodic table, I guess. Um, now, really important, if you're taking this class as an online class with me, this is one of the few things you must print this. If you cannot print this, you need to let me know because you're not allowed to use a you're not use, allowed to use a periodic table or an ion list on another screen to take your tests. You have to have your paper notes sitting right there in front of you. So if you cannot print it, let me know and I will send you one. Okay, but it's very important to print it. Okay, now let's take a look at this. Some examples of pure substances, okay, would be elements. So an element is a type of pure substance that cannot be broken down into simpler substances by chemical changes. So what that means when I look at this is that an oxygen atom is an oxygen atom. You can't take it apart by chemical means. Okay, so it, we know we have an element if it's one of these. And you're gonna notice a few interesting things here. So let's take a look. So um, see here, some of these don't, almost don't make sense. So Fe is iron, okay? And that comes from ferrous or ferric. That's where that comes from. Now, some of them make sense, right? H is hydrogen, okay? Or HE is helium. So some of them are gonna make sense and some of them aren't going to match, okay? So one of the things I want you to do, I wouldn't really want you to pay attention to this periodic table. We'll be using this frequently all the way through because this one, and we'll use this more in the next chapter, this periodic table shows you groups really, really well. And you can take a look at this and you can see all the different kinds of elements that we're gonna be learning about in this class. All right, next we have some pure substances and they're compounds. Now, what makes them a pure substance? Well, a pure substance is exactly the same throughout. So if you have a whole bunch of oxygen, it's a whole bunch of oxygen. And no matter where you have that oxygen, it's going to be oxygen. So if you have pure oxygen here in Maine, or if you have pure oxygen in California, or if you have pure oxygen in uh, Asia or anywhere else, anywhere on the planet, anywhere in the solar system, that pure oxygen is going to be pure oxygen. The same thing is true of compounds as well. Now in a compound, we have elements that are combined. 
Okay, so before we had elements. So you might just have uh, say iron solid or sodium solid or helium gas. And these are all elements. And it just has one element in it. Now we can also have compounds, okay? And when we have compounds, what we have is two or more elements that are chemically bonded, but not always the same thing is still the case. So your sample of H2O is exactly H2O as long as you're talking about pure water anywhere. So pure water H2O is exactly the same anywhere in the universe. Okay, now once we start talking about pond water or tap water or seawater, it's a whole different thing, okay? But when we're talking about pure water or maybe you have this C6H1206 or maybe you have your silver chloride here, AgCl, okay? Those are examples of chemical compounds. Now, we also have something called chemical changes. In a chemical change, we re arrange how the elements are attached to each other. So here in this one, we have two H2 units, okay? And our hydrogen are these little, look like little eyes, could draw eyeballs on them, okay? Now, oxygen is much bigger. So we have one oxygen, molecule because these exist diatomically. So here we have a hydrogen and a hydrogen, and now we have an oxygen, okay? Now, when we put those together, we have two water molecules, okay? And we've rearranged how the elements are. Some other examples might be baking cookies, burning wood, digesting food, anything that changes our substance completely and totally from one to another, is a chemical change. Okay, now let's take a look at mixtures. We were talking about pure substances before with our elements and compounds, but now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at mixtures. Okay, so when we're talking about mixtures, first of all, we have a couple different kinds. First, a mixture is composed of two or more types of matter that can be present in varying amounts, but are not combined chemically. And they can be separated by physical changes. Sometimes that's easier to do than others though. Another big thing is that people will say, oh, a physical change is reversible and a chemical change is not. And that is absolutely not true at all. So um, I've seen uh, people sometimes come out of that from uh, like high school chemistry classes. Um, a chemical change can be reversible and a physical change can sometimes not be reversible. It really depends on the reaction or the change occurring. Okay, so when we look at this, first of all, we have our physical changes. So physical changes change the appearance without actually changing the chemical composition. So you could take a piece of paper and you could cut it in half. You could melt ice and take ice from solid water to liquid water. You can condense liquid. And that's, um, for example, if you have you know, a glass of ice water outside on a hot day and you get that water, that condensation forming around the outside of it, you can do something filtration. I mean, this is how we filter water to make it clean to drink. Um, and then you're just separating the water from your contaminants, okay? Now there's two types of mixtures. One is a homogeneous or homogeneous mixture. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Some examples of that might be tap water or pond water or seawater if you're talking about deep sea water. Um, gasoline, milk, brass. And when I say milk, I list milk in here. Sometimes people say, well, I don't know, not the milk I have. Okay, so if you live on a farm and you're getting whole milk, uh, if you're getting raw milk directly from the cow, then your milk might not look so homogenous. Um, when you uh, have like raw milk, then your milk is not uh, forced to stay homogeneous. And sometimes you'll get that cream separation from the rest of it. And in that case, then that raw milk, you could argue would be a heterogeneous mixture, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, an example of um, a solid homogeneous mixture is brass. An example of a homogeneous mixture that is gaseous would be air. The air that we're breathing has oxygen, nitrogen, and a whole bunch of other things in it. Um, but you can't see those parts. They're the same throughout. Okay, well, that brings us to a heterogeneous mixture. 
Okay, and in a heterogeneous mixture, you can see, often they talk about as visibly distinguishable parts. Okay, so if you go outside and you scoop up some dirt, or you go to the beach and you scoop up some sand, or you buy some potting soil, you would see that there's little bits of all kinds of stuff in there. That's why dirt or soil or sand is a heterogeneous mixture. A jar of jelly beans could be considered a heterogeneous uh, mixture because you can see them and you can see the air in between them. And, um, and then like you could imagine a casserole that you've baked. Um, I don't know if people like to do that. Um, some of you might not, but you know, you put all different kinds of things like lasagna, when you put lasagna together, when you cut into that, you can see all these different parts and that's a heterogeneous mixture. Now, some things are a little bit odd, like here we've got tap water or seawater or pond water in our homogeneous mixtures, but that's when we're only like scooping up the water that we can't see. If you go to the beach and you take a bucket and you go down to the waves and you scoop up some water out of there, you're gonna be able to see tiny bits of sand floating and maybe some seaweed and some little rocks or like some little minnow fish or whatever. So heterogeneous mixture could be like seawater at the beach. Okay, but then in your home, homogeneous or homogeneous mixture, you might have, you might have deep sea water. But even that you might have little bits in it, right? So it really kind of depends. Um, okay. Okay, so now let's go ahead and take a look. This is just a flow chart. Some people love them, so I've got it here. Okay, so this is gonna help you decide where you're at. So first of all, you have matter here and you're gonna ask, does it have a constant properties or composition? If it is constant properties and composition, it's a pure substance. Remember composition means that it's changing and it's not, uh, the composition means how it's put together. Okay, um, so, so like the water isn't changing. I've got allergies, so I'm trying not to sneeze. Sorry. Okay. So we've got our pure substances here. Can it be chemi simplified chemically? So if we can take it apart, then it's a compound. Okay. So where it says, can, can it be chemically sim uh, simplified chemically? What I'm going to do is write take apart. So can we take it apart? Yes, it's a compound. If we can't take it apart, it's an element. Okay, now if it does not have constant properties or composition, so it changes, maybe it's different uh, in Maine than it is in Texas um, or wherever we're going, then we have a mixture, okay? And then is it uniform throughout? Yes, if it's homogeneous, no, and it's heterogeneous, okay? Okay, so now let's take a look at atoms versus molecules. And you could even look at this a little bit as, um, elements versus compounds, though sometimes you'll see some interesting things. All right, let me turn my annotations back on. So some things, for example, are noble gases. Helium is a noble gas and it exists all by itself, okay? Or um, you might have well, all of the noble gases, really, helium, neon, argon. Okay, so these exist all by themselves. They're not diatonics. Some elements exist only stuck to other elements or other similar elements, okay? So hydrogen is one of those. Hydrogen only exists as H2, it's diatomic. Oxygen as O2, and that's by itself. I mean, it's not necessarily going to exist with another one exactly like it within a compound. Oxygen is diatomic. Phosphorus, the most common form of phosphorus is P4. So it's four phosphorus atoms stuck together. One of the common forms of sulfur is S8, eight sulfurs stuck together. Okay, so these are all elements. Okay, now these over here are compounds. And again, they're made of a couple different kinds of elements. So here we've got our water molecule or we've got the one oxygen here and we have the two hydrogens here, okay? And now we have carbon dioxide where we have a carbon in the center and two oxygens on the outside. And now we have glucose. Oh my goodness, this is crazy. Glucose C6H12O6. And the crazy thing here is that this is not even considered a large molecule. I mean, maybe a little bit like general chemistry, but if you get into biology, this isn't very big. You get really, really big ones. Okay, so let's go ahead and isolate all of these. So the red ones here are oxygens. 
Okay, and then all these little ones here are hydrogens. And now it looks like I've made a little centipede. Woo. Okay, so these are just some different uh, formats for those. Okay, now let's take a look at properties. A property is a characteristic that enables us to distinguish one substance from another. So a physical property is a characteristic of matter that is not associated with a change in its chemical composition. Okay, so physical properties, okay, that might be things like its density, its color, its hardness, melting, boiling points, electrical conductivity. Okay, and then to the change of one type of matter into another type or the inability to change is a chemical property. So that might be flammability, toxicity, acidity, reactivity, and heat of combustion. Okay, so let me take a look at my, I've got this pink eraser here. Um, I'm old fashioned and I like pencils and I like erasers. <laughs> I find that they work well and I make mistakes, so I don't like to use ink. Okay. So let's take a look here. With our physical properties, with our eraser, okay, we could say that it is uh, pink. Okay, we could say that it is small. We can say that it is a little bit flexible. I don't know if you can see that. So we could say that it's flexible. Okay. Now, and it's a, it's a little bit squishy. I'll say it's squishy. That's like hardness. <laughs> okay, now look down here at our chemical property. Okay, with our chemical property of my little eraser here, is it flammable? Probably, I bet it'll burn. So it will burn, yes. Is it toxic? I don't think so because they sell these to school kids. So we'll say it's not toxic. It's kind of a rubbery material. So it's not gonna be acidic and that is in and of itself a thing it's probably not gonna react with very many things. And the heat of combustion would say how much energy we needed to make this react. Another example of a chemical property might be um, the, what takes it apart. So for example, if I stick this eraser in bleach, does it come apart? And if the answer is yes, then that would also be a chemical property. Okay, so this image is just sort of showing you uh, some things about what you would see if you were in the lab. So uh, hopefully you're watching this and we've gone back in person, which would be wonderful because being in the lab is really important. And then you'll be able to see these. Uh, if you're watching this because we're all online and you don't get to take a real lab, then I am sorry, but hopefully you'll see one of these in the future. Um, if you work in medicine or in biotech or in, in chemistry or anything, you're going to end up seeing these, okay? And so this blue one here um, is your health hazard and how it ranks in here will tell you if it's a big deal or not, okay? And then over here in the red, we have our fire hazard. And again, what this will tell us is what temperature it'll burn at or its flashpoint. And then over here, we have reactivity. Uh, will it detonate? What will cause it to detonate? Will it have a violent chemical change? Is it unstable if heated? So an example of reactivity might be the idea that if you take sodium metal and you drop it into water, it goes boom. So you actually have to uh, store sodium metal, uh, pure sodium metal in mineral oil, in oils, because if it comes into contact with water, it will explode. <laughs> All right. And then last but not least, we have this one down here. Uh, the W with the line through it. And what this one is doing is this is just showing you um, specific other hazards. Is it an oxidizer? Is it an acid? Is it an alkali? Alkali means, so acid, acidic, alkali, basic. Is it corrosive? Um, the W with the line through it means that you better not let it touch any water. Is it radioactive? And so that's what these will mean. So now we have a couple more and you'll notice in chapter one, there's a lot of terminology that you have to understand. In some of the other chapters, there's very little terminology and it's all math. So the chapters will kind of fluctuate between being all math and no math. 
Now here we have extensive properties and intensive properties. So in these, an extensive property is one that depends upon the amount of matter present. So it might be mass, volume, heat, energy. Remember, so you'll get into this later, but heat is not temperature. Heat is the, the amount of kinetic energy that something has or the amount of potential energy stored and that, that can be described as heat energy. You might have an intensive property, and that doesn't depend on the amount of matter present. So density, whether you have a very tiny thing or a very large thing, the density would be the same if for the same substance. The temperature of a small bit of water standing on the counter and a large container of water standing on the counter would have the same temperature. So that does not depend. So extensive, intensive. Okay, now the next thing that we have, now we're going to get into a little bit of math. So here in chemistry and in all of our sciences and in many other places, we use the metric system. My own personal thing is that I think that the US should switch to the metric system completely because our current system is non-scientific. But, <laughs> okay, many of you taking this class are going to be going into a field that requires you to use the metric system. Now, these are what we call our base units. A base unit is the unit that you kind of return to. So for mass, that would be grams. For volume, liters. For length or distance, we have meters. Time is gonna be in seconds. And your temperature is either going to be in degrees Celsius or in Kelvins. And these are the bases that we're going to be using more. When you get into thermochemistry, you're also going to be working with joules. And that's pretty common as well, but you won't get that until you get to thermo. Okay. Okay, so now let's take a look at a few things. Now, okay, so these are the prefixes that go with the metric system that are smaller than the base unit, okay? We have femto, pico, nano. So what does this mean? Well, as you can see here, it says that there are one times 10 to the negative sixth liters in one microliter, that's right here. And sometimes you'll see it as a U and sometimes you'll see it as this funny looking U which is called mu. It's only used with a U if you're using a, a keyboard or a type system that doesn't allow you to use the Greek character mu. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, this means you come over here and you say one times 10 to the negative sixth. And for example, you could say liters in one microliter. Okay, well, one times 10 to the negative sixth, what does that mean? You can also, and here you have it here, but you can also turn it around down here and say that there are one times 10 to the sixth microliters in one liter. Another way to write that is a million microliters in one liter. And sometimes I like to use these common conversions at the bottom because I think they make a little bit more sense. You can use either one. You can either use it as it's written in the chart or you can use it as it's written down here. It won't change your answer at all as long as you're using it correctly. Okay. And then here you can see uh, just for an example of another one here, we have one times 10 to the negative two or 0 0.01 meters in one centimeter. Okay, well, if anybody's ever looked at a ruler, you probably know that there's 100 centimeters in a meter. Okay, and there's one times 10 to the, neg to the ninth nanometers in a meter. That one's really, really important when we start talking about light. Okay, 1,000 milliliters in a liter. Okay, so everything here on this page is smaller than a base unit. Okay, now you're going to need this going forward. So if you don't have printed slides, I've got to figure out who I am. If you don't have printed slides, then pause the video and write this one down for sure, for sure. Okay, now let's look at the next one. And then I'm actually going to show you a little bit of math. Okay, now these are common unit prefixes that are larger than a base unit. Okay, so I'm gonna put that here really big, larger than base. Okay, so the common ones for those are kilo, mega, giga, and tera. And the ones that we're going to see a lot of um, are meters to kilometers, grams to kilogram. I would say that this kilo, kilo is definitely the biggest one. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the one that you'll use the most often. It's not the largest of the, of the units. Okay, so how do you read this? Well, you look over here and you see this, you say one times 10 to the third, you could say meters is equal to one kilometer. 
Okay, here you have mega. Oh, okay, so again, you would say one times 10 to the sixth, I don't know, you could say grams is equal to one megagram. Okay, and that's how you would write this. Okay, and then you have, a, I have written a couple here that are not in scientific notation. All right, so now let's actually take just a moment here and Okay, before we go on, I am going to, hello. <laughs> we're gonna go to the whiteboard and we're gonna do a couple of little problems. Okay, so first of all, let's take a look at this. What we're gonna do is we're going to do a couple of math problems. And the first thing that we're gonna do is using those tables on those last two charts, we're going to convert 15.7 microseconds to seconds, and we're going to convert 15.7 kilometers, whoops, to meters. And the last thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna convert 96.8, uh, whoops, milligrams to kilograms. Okay, so this is how you're going to do it. You're going to use those charts that you had on the previous slides. So let's go ahead and take a look at setting these up. The first one, you use this first piece here. It's called your known or your given. 15.7 microseconds. Now a microsecond, we know because it's on that first one, a microsecond is a lot smaller than a second. Okay, so I'm going to use the common conversion that I have there that says that there are one times 10 to the sixth microseconds in one second. Okay, so I'm going to bring my calculator over here. So this is really, really important. Some of you might have found that there's an app for that. Don't use your app. Okay, so the reason I don't want you to use your app to do these conversions is because it's really, really important that you be able to do the conversions, that you be able to understand what you're, where you're going, which direction you're going in, um, so that these quantities mean something to you in a lab or in healthcare or wherever you're working with. Okay, so when we're doing this, the way you are going to put this into your calculator, okay, is every calculator does things a little bit differently. So let's take a look at this. You're going to type in 15.7 divided by, okay? Now, some. then you're gonna type in one, and then you're either going to put in something like this, EXP, an exponent button, or an EE button, okay? Or an EE button, big like that, stands for exponential expression. Sometimes you'll have, especially on the graphing calculators, it's two keystrokes, it's second and comma. Every now and then you'll actually have a times 10 to the X button. But this is what you're going to do. I do not want you to do times 10 caret. If you do this, I would say about half the time it will come out wrong. And if you don't really know what you're looking for, um, you won't know when it's wrong and when it's right. A lot of times it has to do with whether or not you're in the denominator. Okay, if I want you to grab your calculator and I want you to work this with me. If you don't get the same answer that I get, then what you need to do is you, <laughs> is you need to figure out why you didn't get the same thing I got. One of the best ways to do that is take a picture of your calculator and send it to me. Okay, and I will be able to tell you what the exact keystrokes are for that. Okay, so coming back to this, I grab my calculator and I'm going to type in 15.7 divided by one, I have an EE button, EE six. Okay, so again, that's 15.7 divided by one, and then your special button, maybe that's an EE or an EXP, all those different things, and then the button six. I'm gonna go right to the six. Not, you don't use the times 10 of the, to the at all. And what I get on my calculator, they get one of two things, point one, two, three, four, one, five, seven. Okay. Usually something like this, I would probably write it in scientific notation which would be 1.57 times 10 
And so we take a look here and we've got one, two, three, four, five. And so this becomes 1.57 times 10 to the fifth. And the units that we're looking for are seconds. Now let's go ahead and look at the next one. And uh, so we have 15.7 kilometers. Now we remember from before that there are 1000 meters in one kilometer. And you might be saying, why am I putting, like this one went on the bottom and this one went on the top. Well, the reason for that is I'm canceling my unit. So here I have microseconds on the top. So I need microseconds on the bottom. That's how they cancel. Okay, so in this case, I have kilometers on the top. So I need kilometers on the bottom. And that's why I have it set up like so. Now, in this case, I'm just doing 15.7 times 1,000, 1, 5, 700. So 15,700 meters. I would probably write it like this, but you could also write it like this, 1.57 times 10 to the fourth meters. Now let's look at 96.8 milligrams to kilogram. Okay, so I'm going to set this up over here. Now for this one, I don't have a conversion that goes all the way from milligrams to kilogram. But what I can do is I can go to the base first. So I can say, okay, well, 96.8 milligrams. I do have one that says that there are 1,000 milligrams in one gram. Okay. Well, that allows me then to cancel my milligrams. And then I need to cancel out my grams. So I put grams on the top and kill bottom and kilograms on the top, sorry. And I know that there are 1,000 grams in one kilogram. So what this is, is 96.8 divided by 1,000 equals, and then divided by 1,000. 96.8 divided by 1,000, enter, divided by 1,000, enter, okay? And you can get two answers for that, point one, two, three, four, nine, six, eight. So point zero, 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 nine, six, eight kilograms or in scientific notation, 9.68 times 10 to the negative fifth kilograms. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and Come back here. All right. So now what we're doing is we're looking at density. Lots and lots. Okay. Now we're looking at density. So density is mass divided by volume. Okay. So mass divided by volume. Now some people have trouble turning this around. So density is, you could call it mass over volume. Now you could also say then that mass is equal to density times volume, okay? Or that volume is equal to mass divided by density, okay? So you can isolate any of these. There's actually three here. If we're talking about solids, our answer is in grams per centimeter cubed. If we're talking about liquids, our answer is in grams per milliliter. If we're talking about gases, our answer will be in grams per liter. Now here's a really big thing. Grams per centimeter cubed and grams per milliliter are the exact same thing. One centimeter cubed is equal to one milliliter. So just know that they're the exact same thing. Okay, so before we can do this, what we need is we need to say, okay, well, um, let's take a look at a couple of different ways to find the vol a volume. Okay, because that's going to be really important here. The volume of a rectangular solid is length times width times height. Okay, so let's say that we have a rectangle solid. Okay, and we'll call this length and width and height. And we just multiply them all together. The thing is, is that they have to be in the same set of units. Okay, another uh, volume that we're going to need to know about is the volume of a sphere. All right, and so here we have a sphere. Okay, and where are we getting these numbers? Well, right here, straight through the center, 
okay, for those of you that haven't seen this in a while, is our diameter. Half of our diameter is our radius. Okay, so you can find the radius by just dividing the diameter by two. And the way you would find this is you would say that the volume of your sphere is equal to four thirds times pi times the radius cubed. Make sure that you do that radius cubed part, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at a problem here. Okay, so the problem that I wanna show you for this says that we have a metal sphere with a diameter equal to 10.8 centimeters and a density of 5.8 grams per centimeter cubed. Okay, all right, grams per centimeter cubed. So now let's say we need a question, right? What is the mass? And usually in this case, when they say, what is the mass is they're looking for it in grams. Okay, so remember a couple things here. Density is equal to mass over volume. We're gonna be solving for mass, which means that we need mass equal to density times volume. Okay, great. Here we have our density right here but we don't have a volume. We have a dimension, 10.8 centimeters. So the first thing that we need to do here, step one is going to be to find our volume. Okay, so if our diameter is equal to 10.8 centimeters, then our radius is half that. So we do 10.8 divided by two, which is 5.4 centimeters. Now we find our volume and we say that volume is four thirds times pi times our radius cubed, 5.4 centimeters cubed. Okay, again, you should get out your calculator. So we have 5.4, now we need to cube it. Okay, and then times pi times four divided by three. So you think, hmm, you know, this isn't, this isn't real big, right? This is going to weigh our thing here that's about 10.8 centimeters in diameter is going to have a volume of 659.8 five, eight, three, six, six. Okay, so I could keep going, but this is two significant figures in it. Uh, and I, um, right here, and that'll make more sense in a bit. So just bear with me for now. So because we have just these two significant figures, that means that we have 660 cubic centimeters. Okay. Now that we have our volume, we can go with our step two. And our step two now is to solve for our density. Okay, find density. So now we have density is equal to mass over volume. Oh, whoops, we're not finding our density. I already have my density. Okay, I have my density right here. I'm looking for mass, find mass. Okay, now we have M is equal to density times volume. 
and our density is 5.8 grams per centimeter cubed times our volume, which is 660 centimeters cubed. And now I can take a look here. I've got centimeters cubed in the bottom and they'll cancel with those centimeters cubed. All right, so here I have my calculator and I do 5.8 times 660 and I get 3,828 grams, which would be a little over kil uh, three kilograms, so 3.8 kilograms, okay? All right, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and stop there and that's gonna end part one, come back for video part two, but I wanted to give you a little break, take a little break myself, and you'll have that second video in there. Hopefully the second video won't be quite as long as the first one. So as always, if you are concerned about something or you have questions, send me an email. Thank you.